So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we, as I just said, we'll be recording this lecture and sending it out to everyone uh, who registered for tonight's uh, virtual community lecture. Um, and tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Megan Bishop, who is one of our sports medicine surgeons here at Rothman Orthopedics. Um, Dr. Bishop specializes in Sports-related injuries to the knee, shoulder, and elbow, and some of her clinical interests include ACL reconstruction, multi-ligament knee injuries, knee meniscal tears, and patellofemoral instability and pain. She is currently seeing patients at our Madison Avenue and Harrison offices. And just a little fun fact about Dr. Bishop, uh, she was a former Division I collegiate track and, track and field athlete and she was also a 2020 U.S. Olympic Marathon Trials Qualifier. The topic that she'll be speaking on today is my knee hurts, can I still run and work out? And uh, if you have any questions throughout the course of tonight's lecture, there's a little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can type your question in there and we will answer as many as we can um, at the end of Dr. Bishop's lecture. So I will turn it over to you. All right, um, Jen, can you see my screen okay? Yep, perfect. All right, perfect. All right, thank you for that introduction and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, again, my name is Megan Bishop um, and I'm sports medicine and shoulder elbow surgeon at Rothman Orthopedics. Um, I'm going to be talking on the topic, my knee hurts, can I still run and work out? So the goal kind of of this lecture is to give you guys a background of some of the most common causes of pain in the knee and kind of to have a athletic active focus to it uh, and address a lot of questions that people have, uh, whether or not they can still kind of keep working out despite some pain in the knee. Um, so again, uh, I'm located both up in Harrison location in, in Westchester, as well as our uh, flagship location at 645 Madison Ave. Just a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, I attended the College of William and Mary where I, I ran track and cross country, as Jen said, and I really stayed up with uh, being, you know, at an athlete still uh, and still run um, competitively with marathons. Um, so I definitely have the, uh, you know, personal interest in kind of staying healthy and active as well. Um, I attended George Washington University for medical school, then went on and did my residency at Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. And then uh, I did most recently my sports medicine fellowship was at Hospital for Special Surgery, um, where I work with the Knicks and work with Iona Gales. Uh, so um, have a professional interest, obviously, and um, experience in kind of the treating the athletic population. So kind of an overview of our topics today include, we'll start with just background and anatomy on some knee pain. Uh, and then we're gonna go over four main causes of knee pain, um, starting with meniscus tears and then um, running runner's knee, also known as patellofemoral pain syndrome. Briefly touch upon IT band syndrome and then finish with knee osteoarthritis. So in, in keeping with the theme of the lecture, um, there's a lot of benefits to exercise and staying active. Uh, so things such as running and any kind of cardiovascular activity is gonna improve your cardiovascular fitness. It can reduce overall mortality rates, uh, allows for weight control. Um, people that have kind of impact exercises have improved bone density and muscle coordination. Uh, you can improve your blood pressure, your cholesterol, boost your immune system, have stress reduction and reduced anxiety and depression. On the flip side, you know, there are risks to exercise. Uh, knee pain is rather common. Um, it's a common complaint among active people, uh, and it affects up to 25% of US adults or even higher than that. The highest prevalence is seen in people over the age of 75, um, but is seen in the younger population too. And it's more commonly reported in women. So when we talk about knee pain, uh, we try to break this down into a number of different structures that surround the knee. Uh, so when we look at the knee, the knee itself, there's muscles and tendons, there's the cartilage that lines the surfaces, uh, the bones that make up the knee joint, nerves around the knee, blood um, vessels around the knee, as well as ligaments. Specifically, the knee is made up of um, three bones. It's made up of your femur or your thigh bone, your tibia or your shin bone or your kneecap or patella. 
Uh, additionally, outside of that is your fibula, which can contribute to um, knee pain as well. And then, you know, there's a number of ligaments uh, that make up the knee. And these are always things that we have to have in our differential, especially for a more acute knee injury. Um, you have your ACL which, and PCL, which are the two cruciates that cross in the center of the knee and help provide stability. You have your medial collateral ligament, which is on the inside of the knee, and your lateral collateral ligament, which is on the outside of the knee. So those make up the four main ligaments that stabilize the knee. Then you have your meniscus. So you have a meniscus on the medial side or inside of the knee, and a meniscus on the lateral side or the outside of the knee. Um, so these are very common um, areas of, of complaints for people, especially with the meniscus. And then finally, you have the articular cartilage. So the cartilage lines both the, the surfaces of the femur, of your tibia, as well as your kneecap, and that can be a source of pain as well. So we'll first talk about meniscus tears. So what exactly is the meniscus? So the meniscus are the two C-shaped cartilaginous pads that are on the inside and the outside of your knee. They act as shock absorbers to kind of dissipate forces um, and try to preserve your knee and prevent osteoarthritis from forming. They're tough and rubbery and they act to cushion the joint. And this, is, um, this picture here is an arthroscopic picture inside the knee joint. And the top is your femur, the bottom is your tibia, and that's a nice white cartilage that lines that. And then this is a small picture that you can see on the outside. This is the C-shaped medial meniscus, and that looks normal there. So when a patient tears their meniscus, what kind of symptoms do they have? Um, so in going through clinical history, um, a meniscus tear often will occur after an acute injury. So it's more common, you know, if someone twists or pivots and they feel a sharp pain in their knee, um, that would be a, more of an acute meniscus tear. There can be more degenerative meniscus tears as well that kind of occur over wear and tear over time in our more older population as well. And those are associated with osteoarthritis. Patients will describe discomfort either on the inside or outside of the knee on the joint line. Um, and it's often point tenderness to pain. So you can kind of take your finger and point to one spot and you know, over the joint line and that's indicative of possible meniscus tear. It gets worse with activity. Um, patients will describe with stiffness. Sometimes you'll get fluid on the knee or swelling. And occasionally you'll have what we call mechanical symptoms, which means you can get some locking or catching of the knee itself. Um, and we diagnose these first based on clinical exam. Um, so again, looking for any kind of swelling inside the knee. And this example on the bottom shows a swollen right knee as compared to a left knee. Um, then we look for joint line tenderness. So here this um, physician is using their thumb to push on the inside and outside of the joint line and looking for point tenderness to pain. And then there's specific tests that we use to diagnose meniscal injuries. So this is called McMurray's test, um, where you actually are kind of flexing up your knee and twisting um, and rotating to be able to kind of in trigger pain or click inside the knee. And that's specific for meniscus injury as well. And then we get imaging. So we always get x-rays, just look for any kind of alignment issues, osteoarthritis, rule out any kind of fracture, especially if it was an acute injury. But most patients with meniscus tears are gonna end up with an MRI. Um, and, and the MRI will give us our definitive diagnosis. This is um, a picture of the knee from the side. So your femur's up top, your tibia is at the bottom. This black bow tie shaped structure is your meniscus. So this should look like a nice solid black bow tie shaped structure. However, this white line here, which can be seen on the side and from the front is an example of a tear in your medial meniscus. So there's a number of different types of meniscus tears and this is important for treatment. Um, so again, there are injury-related tears, and this picture at the bottom is an example of what we call a bucket handle tear, where a big piece of the meniscus actually flips into the notch, and patients will lose their range of motion and get very stiff with this. Um, these are often associated with ACL tears, and there's another of different shapes to meniscus tears, which can be shown in this picture here. Based on kind of the etiology of the tear and the location of the tear, this kind of helps us how we treat it. So a lot of these more acute tears, especially these bucket and handle tears, will require surgery to be able to kind of continue on and be active. However, there's a number of tears that are more minor that you know, often do not require surgery and kind of can either asymptomatic, heal on their own, uh, or get better kind of with a, an injection. And these kind of include the degenerative tears, or these are the wear and tear meniscus tears over time. So you know, your structures inside your knee are gonna get a little bit um, thinner um, and the cartilage weakens with time. Uh, so here is a meniscus and it kind of just shows some general fraying to the edge of it. So these are the kind of 
degenerative type meniscus tears that don't really have an acute injury often, but they kind of will develop symptoms for people. Uh, and the last type of meniscus tear I just want to mention is a special type called a meniscal root tear. And these can be seen in both young patients and in old patients. And so what's special about these types of tears is the actual attachment site of the meniscus completely tears off. So you, at this point, you've kind of rendered your meniscus non-functional because it's kind of flapping in, in the knee joint without any kind of stabilization. So, you know, this actually can be associated with faster progression of arthritis in the knee because the meniscus isn't working well. So even in older patients, we might recommend fixing this type of meniscus tear. Um, general treatment for these, we'll start with any activity modification, um, anti-inflammatories, and physical therapy. Um, and the, um, additionally, patients can often get improvement from something like a cortisone injection. This is for more of the um, degenerative type tears or the more of the insidious onset tears. The more acute pivoting type meniscus tears um, often might need surgery to be able to fix. Um, so patients will ask me, I injured my meniscus, can I still work out? Um, so what I'll tell you is it depends on the type of tear and the location of your tear, as I said before. So those bucket handle tears or those big tears that lock inside your knee, you're going to need surgery to be able to fix that, uh, at least to be able to get their motion back. Um, some of the younger patient tears, uh, if they're more towards the outside of the blood supply, those have a good chance of healing and sometimes will heal on their own. Um, but if they don't, sometimes we will try to fix those instead of taking them out. Um, and then it depends on your symptoms. So, you know, you can have an asymptomatic meniscus tear, meaning there could be a small tear that you may have had in your knee for years and not really even known it. It doesn't mean you need to get surgery at that point. You know, if you've been going on and exercising and doing the things you've wanted to do without symptoms, then, you know, you can continue to do that. Um, so ultimately, I recommend say this, it comes down to your symptoms and performance. If you are able to, you know, functionally do the things you want to do and, you're living with a meniscus tear and it's not really bothering you, then for sure, you can keep doing those types of activities. It's good for you to stay active. Um, however, if it's limiting your ability to continue to exercise or to do the things you want to do, you really shouldn't have to live your life in pain. And we've got treatment options for you to be able to help take care of that. Um, just an example, you know, from really two weeks ago, Joel Embiid in the um, basketball playoffs was diagnosed with a small lateral meniscus tear um, that was in, uh, sustained in game three or game four from the first series. And he's already back playing and has you know, scored 40 points or something his game back. So you can perform at a high level with these types of tears. Um, it really you know, ultimately comes down to your symptoms and, how, and your performance. So like I said, if it doesn't get better and you're not able to do things you wanna do, there are operative treatments for this. You can either repair the meniscus depending on the type or you can trim the meniscus down. And this is just an example, just to show you what it looks like for trimming the meniscus. Um, this is an example of a knee arthroscopy. This is a shaver that we use that goes inside the knee joint uh, to be able to trim down any kind of loose fragments. This picture on the left is something called a biter, so that we use that to trim down the ed loose edges of the meniscus. And down here, you can see what the frayed edges looked like, and then afterwards, it's a much more smooth edge. And these are pretty quick recoveries. Meniscal uh, meniscectomies is usually a six to eight week cover recovery. You're bearing weight right away and hopefully back to you know, most activities by six to eight weeks. And you know, people will ask me, part of my meniscus is gone. Am I going to get arthritis because you took my meniscus away? Um, so you know, gen generally you will have a higher chance of arthritis uh, with a removal of meniscal tissue. However, we do try to preserve as much as possible. So I'm not gonna take more than necessary. Um, and that meniscus tissue wasn't really functioning that well anyway with the tear. So um, it certainly can help your symptoms. Um, and a lot of these degenerative type tears are already associated with pre-existing arthritis. So there already is some arthritis in the knee. So you know, treating the tear can make you somewhat predisposed to arthritis in the future. Um, but oftentimes, um, you, know, you may be predisposed to getting that arthritis already, or it could, you could already have some underlying arthritis. Uh, but the bottom line is I'll always try to save as much meniscus as possible to try to prevent that. So our next topic is runner's knee or patellofemoral pain syndrome. So this is you know, one of the dreaded uh, uh, knee pain of runners. It happens very frequently. It's one of the most common things I see in my office. Um, so this is, it has to do with uh, kind of a number of factors. Number one, it can be softening of the cartilage underneath the, knee, the kneecap, uh, which is known as chondromalacia. Um, it can be associated with some inflammation, essentially in the lining around the kneecap. 
and also can be associated with the kneecap just not tracking right. And it doesn't necessarily mean there's something actually wrong inside the knee. It has a lot to do with the structures that surround the knee. The muscles, the tendons can be weak, can be tight, and that can lead to your kneecap not tracking right, increased pressures underneath the kneecap, and pain. Um, so patients that have this anterior knee pain describe, or patellofemoral pain, usually describe pain in the front of the knee, underneath the kneecap. You can often get popping or clicking underneath the knee um, cap as well, and pain after sitting for prolonged periods of time and when going from sitting to standing. People often describe pain like when they're sitting on an airplane. Um, pain is worse, particularly going downstairs. Uh, those are kind of the stereotypical um, descriptions of patellofemoral pain. And it comes from a number um, of different reasons, but number one, the most common is overuse. Uh, you see this commonly in runners, just increasing their mileage. Uh, people that are doing uh, more uh, just general working out. Um, people that have the kind of changes in footwear or playing surfaces sometimes can be predisposed to this as well. I've even seen it during the pandemic in patients that literally just sit all day at their desk, um, just from not using their kneecap as much and kind of getting weak muscles around the knee and getting increased pain as well when trying to get back to activity. Uh, sometimes it can have to do with patient anatomy as well. Uh, there's certain um, uh, the way the patient's bones are structured that can make your kneecap more predisposed to having pain underneath it, whether or not your kneecap rides too high or you have some weak muscles surrounding the knee that makes your kneecap track right. And then we, we will determine that based on imaging as well as based on physical exam assessment and clinic. And then some patients will have some arthritis or that chondromalacia underneath their kneecap. So how do we diagnose the runner's knee? So the main way is clinical exam for this. Um, based on that history that I just said, you know, a patient tells me, oh, I have pain really just going downstairs with squatting um, in the front of the knee. I don't really have that much swelling. I occasionally will get some clicking. Uh, that's kind of the pathognomonic symptoms of runner's knee or patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, I always in my clinic have patients do a single leg step down. I'll put them up on a stool and the pain, knee that's hurting, I'll have them um, stand on one leg and step down with their other leg to the ground as slow as they can. And oftentimes you'll be super wobbly on that knee. And that really just shows you're not supporting the knee well with your muscles, your quad, your glutes. And that can be um, uh, something that we know that you can work on uh, to be able to fix. Uh, always get x-rays just to look at your alignment, as I said. And then, you know, an MRI often isn't necessary in these cases, because as I said, there's often not something exactly structurally wrong inside the knee. So um, I only get an MRI if patients don't get better or have, you know, something like swelling or something that I'm more concerned that there could be something else going on. The general treatment for the patellofemoral pain syndrome will start with the rest, ice, compression, elevation, you know, for acute episodes of pain. Uh, a course of anti-inflammatories will often give something for about two weeks to try to calm things down. The mainstay of treatment of this is going to be physical therapy, and that's going to be focusing on strengthening uh, the supporting structures around the knee, particularly your quadriceps, your glutes, your hips. Um, you, you'd be really surprised even people that are very strong, go to the gym, work out, um, will often not have um, strong hips. Um, people are very weak there. Um, sometimes bracing um, or taping can be helpful with the kneecap. Um, injections are always an option, cortisone um, and gel shot or viscous supplementation injections. And then um, orthotics can be helpful as well. Um, patients that have flat feet are often more predisposed uh, to having knee pain. Uh, so sometimes even just putting a little orthotic in your shoe can be really helpful with preventing this. So um, I have runners knee. Patients will ask, can I still work out? So generally, yes, I say you can still work out. Um, you may want to avoid some of the exercises that really seem to aggravate it at the time. Uh, so deep squatting exercises often seem to be uh, more aggravating for patients. Um, I always say the goal, my golden rule is if it really hurts, you should probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, so, you know, if you're going through, um, if you're running and running really seems to be the thing that aggravates it, you might want to just cross train for a little bit and be able to, uh, you know, bike or do the elliptical or something until you get through that really acute inflammatory phase. Um, so, you know, if you do have mild pain um, you're, and you're doing your physical therapy exercises and it's really not getting worse, um, you know, I generally say you're okay to keep working out. You're okay to keep running, so long as you're not getting an in increase in your level of pain or noticing things like catching, swelling. Um, those would be signs that you're doing too much. But you know, continuing your PT exercises uh, is going to be important in the long term. Um, if all else fails, too, there is surgical treatment for this. Um, generally, rarely have to do this, but 
um, are arthroscopic, so through two small portals, just like for the metastectomy, basically just cleaning up any kind of cartilage wear underneath the kneecap. And then this is really for recalcitrant patellofemoral pain uh, and, and if there's cartilage wear associated with that. So there's something called a tibial tubercle osteotomy where we actually move the attachment site of the patellar tendon, which is the tibial tubercle, to kind of offload that area of cartilage uh, defect or pain. Um, it is a big recovery, so really you need to have an appropriate indication for this and really have failed um, all conservative management. Um, so moving on to our next topic is IT band syndrome. Uh, I just wanted to quickly touch upon this as uh, you know, another common um, cause of knee pain in active patients. Um, IT band is a structure that is a kind of a fascial band, which is seen here, and runs all the way up from your iliac crest in your hip, across your hip bone, and down the outside of your thigh, and attaches on the outside of your tibia, just so it crosses your lateral or outside knee joint. Um, so patients can describe the pain with IT band syndrome really, really throughout the length of this. The most common area is around the attachment site, around the outside of the knee, or where it kind of rubs against the femur um, on the lateral femoral condyle, or right above your knee. Um, patients will um, this is sometimes describe like a snapping you can get on that area, both up, up at the hip or down by the knee as well. Um, patients that have IT band syndrome often describe, you know, recent changing changes in training. It's often when you start kind of with a new training cycle or start um, upping your volume, upping your intervals. Um, I also see it pretty, pretty frequently when patients start to taper um, prior to a race, um, meaning like kind of back off from activities as well. It's common to get some irritation of your IT band as well. Um, patients will get this as well when they run on uneven terrain or um, hills seem to make it worse as well too. Um, and that is additionally associated with weakness in the hip abductors and hip flexors. Um, the exam here, you're going to be tender along your IT band, soreness on the outside of the knee specifically. Um, often don't have any swelling in the knee with this. Occasionally, I said, you can get some clicking. And then here's something called the overtest, um, where we're stretching the IT band uh, off the table and you'll have tightness on that side as compared to the other. Treatment for this, again, um, rest if needed, if it's really severe, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy is gonna be your mainstay of treatment to correct any kind of weaknesses and biomechanical issues. Um, for specific to the IT band, foam rolling can be really important, really stretching can be important. And then for recalcitrant cases, there is injections that we can do over there, cortisone or plate-rich plasma, which I'll touch upon a little bit more later. Um, so with IT band syndrome, can you still work out? So yes, uh, I tell people really stretch away. You can't overstretch the IT band. Um, so IT band stretches, um, which you can even easily can look up, um, uh, can be done really throughout the day. Um, massage can be very helpful for this. A sports massage to make sure you're keeping your IT band loose. Sometimes acupuncture trigger points can be very helpful too. Um, heating prior to a run around that distal knee or around your knee um, can be helpful too. Um, try to avoid hills during the time when it's actively really bothering you. Running on a more flat surface might help um, reduce some of that discomfort. Uh, making sure you keep your shoes updated. Um, old shoes, you know, if it's over three to 400 miles on them can make you more predisposed to having some of this discomfort as well as with patellofemoral pain too. Um, and then, you know, again, be smart. If it's really not important, uh, improving rest and cross-training uh, are necessary. Um, so the last topic um, is uh, osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, what exactly is osteoarthritis? Uh, so osteoarthritis is the loss of cartilage or the, um, the lining of, your, of the surfaces of the joint. So cartilage is a um, smooth um, structure that lines both the tibia, uh, sorry, the femur, the tibia, as well as your kneecap. So you can get damage to that cartilage throughout any of those portions that cause pain inside the knee. Um, this is kind of an example of fresh cartilage here on the uh, outside of the knee and on the inside of the knee. This is what a, a, an example of kind of damaged cartilage down to the bone. And here's an in vivo uh, picture. Cartilage is the white up here. You can see exposed bone beneath that and then some inflamed synovium. So the pain that you get with arthritis is coming from those inflamed tissues and then exposed bone because cartilage doesn't itself hurt. Um, it can, the structures around that is, is what's gonna cause the pain. So arthritis is a big problem. It's the number one cause of chronic disability in the US. And by 2030, um, there's a, expected to be 67 million adults uh, or 25% of the adult population to be affected with osteoarthritis of the knee. So incredibly common. 
Um, there's a number of etiologies uh, towards arthritis. So primary is uh, just general aging. Your, your bone st structure, your cartilage structure is gonna change with age. You lose some water, you lose some ability kind of to repair um, and genetics. So a lot of people will be like, oh, my mom had bilateral knee replacements or a hip replacement, things like that. So there is a genetic link to arthritis. And then there's secondary causes as well. Um, so, you know, obesity can be a cause um, as well as uh, trauma to the knee. So people that have prior injuries to the knee, uh, like I said before, you know, if you lose your whole meniscus, you're going to be uh, predisposed to getting arthritis later on, ACL tears, things like that, fractures can predispose you to arthritis. Um, so symptoms of arthritis, again, you're going to have pain that's worse with prolonged use, stiffness that's worse with after periods of inactivity. Um, swelling, periods of swelling that kind of come and go, um, and then it, kind of a grinding type feeling inside the knee. We can diagnose arthritis on x-ray, so no MRI needed. Um, here you can see an example of uh, normal joint space here, and then this is an example of arthritis. So you lose the space between your joints because those car that cartilage uh, is getting worn away. Um, you can get bone spurs and uh, with that as well um, are signs of arthritis. So treatment to arthritis is kind of a latter approach to treatment. So we start on the most, you know, minimally invasive treatment and kind of and work our way up all the way to surgery. Uh, so kind of starting at your first step, um, we're trying to help you live with your pain and stay active. Um, so number one, um, always weight management. So I always tell patients really long term, the best thing you can do for your knees is try to maintain a healthy weight. Um, every pound, uh, excess pound you have weight is four pounds on your knees. So if you think of it that way, um, it, it's, it kind of gives you a way to conceptualize it. Um, so some studies have shown you can get reduced symptoms for osteoarthritis and up to 90% by weight reduction. So long-term, if you know you have some osteoarthritis in your knees, trying to stay healthy, stay active uh, is going to be the best thing you can do. Um, lower impact activities, meaning like elliptical, cycling, um, limiting your you know, marathon running and things like that, which is hard for me to say, but um, is uh, going to be better in the long term. And then keeping your knees strong with physical therapy also can be important, especially some, with some of that kneecap arthritis. Um, getting that kneecap to track better can be very helpful. Um, and then kind of you know, the next step, there's also oral medications that can be taken, anti-inflammatories uh, such as NSAIDs, Tylenol, um, some people will get some benefit from glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, which is a, a, an herbal medication you can just, like a vitamin that you can just buy at CVS. I would say about 50% of people get some improvement with that. Um, and then your next step is injections. So cortisone injection can be done in the office the day you come in. It's really helpful for acute inflammatory episodes. You don't want to do them more often than three to four times a year, however, it could, because it can damage the cartilage if you do it too frequently. Um, but they are very effective. Uh, and then there's the visco supplementation or gel shots. So these are the made up of something called hyaluronic acid, which is um, kind of a naturally occurring substance that's in the joint fluid. Um, so it's really adding jelly back into your knee, but the you know the most um, it's really mostly taking down inflammation. Um, and then people a lot of times ask about biologic type injections. Uh, so these are newer type injections um, that are made of. Um, you know, cells essentially to inject back in your knee. So the first is called plate-rich rich, platelet -rich plasma, where we take your own blood and spin it down and get all the good growth factors from your platelets and inject it back into the knee. Um, there's a number of different uses for this. You can use it in tendons. Like I said, um, you can use it with IT band syndrome. You can use, but the main actually, two, there's two places that this has really been shown to work in the body. It's for the tennis elbow. And then there's actually a number of studies that do show this helps with pain control at one year greater than the gel shot injections um, in the knee. So the knee is pretty proven for arthritis for this PRP to help. Um, the other option too, there's stem cells and people ask about stem cells all the time for this. Um, not a lot of research out there on that yet. So, you know, the jury's still out on them. Um, the main points of these, both with the PRP and the stem cells, they don't actually regrow cartilage. So there's nothing it's doing to heal your knee. All it's doing is helping pain. So, you know, they're expensive. So I generally use these as a kind of last resort uh, type uh, treatment. I'd rather try cortisone or visco supplementation first unless patients would prefer to try like the PRP just because, you know, it's helping with pain. It's not regrowing or healing anything. Um, so, you know, once you get arthritis, can you still work out? Um, so yes, it's good for you to keep working out. So lower impact activities are always going to be better. So like I said, again, pelotoning, um, 
swimming, um, running you can still do, but you might want to incorporate cross training with it. Um, so instead of running seven days a week, you might want to cut your running back to three to four um, and um, making sure you're keeping up to date on your shoe wear, like I said before. Um, so just some modified activity. Um, you can definitely stay active. Um, maintaining, it's going to help you maintain that healthy weight, staying active. So that's what I said, the number one important thing you can do for your knees. And then motion is lotion. Um, and uh, what I mean by this is weight bearing and actually activity is actually good for your cartilage uh, to a certain extent. So healthy cartilage has actually been shown to uh, adapt to repetitive loads by thickening and increasing thickness. So patients that are sedentary are going to have less thick cartilage than the active patients. So you're actually protecting your knees by getting out and working out. And when we look specifically at people that are runners and looking at osteoarthritis, um, you know, there's a number of studies out there that show that running doesn't lead to osteoarthritis that can actually be protective. Um, this one study looked at a comparison of uh, recreational runners, non-runners, and the competitive runner. And they found that the recreational runner had a lot less chance at 3.5% risk of osteoarthritis compared to the non-runner, which was 10%. Uh, however, there's a limit to this. The competitive runner did have a higher chance at 13.3. So obviously everything in moderation, um, is uh, important, but running is actually good for you. Um, like I said, it can help thicken your cartilage. Um, this here shows um, years to fatigue of cartilage and the sedentary patient in this example has a faster um, year to fatigue of their cartilage than the more active patients. So here's the 10 miles per week runner um, and the walker, and then additionally, the uh, 100 mile per week. So 100 mile per week is going to make you much more uh, uh, prone to getting arthritis. Uh, but the, you know, at the 10 mile uh, per week, it, it's, uh, it's somewhat protective. Um, and so finally, the top of the ladder, there's surgery options for osteoarthritis. So for pre-joint replacement, um, for people that have specific unif un very focal cartilage defects, and I, this is the type of surgery that I do, um, for you know more younger active patients that have these focal small cartilage defects, um, you can do um, certain cartilage replacement surgeries. So there's something called osteochondral allograft or autograft transfer, where we either take a bone plug from the cartilage in your own knee or from a donor that has a bone plug with cartilage on top and use that to replace that area of cartilage. The other um, cartilage replacement procedure that's commonly done is called matrix-induced autologous chondrocyte implantation. And that's a big word, but we usually call it MACI. So this is where we actually take a biopsy of your own cartilage, and then it goes into a lab, and it grows onto a, 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 um, a collagen sheet to be re-implanted back into the knee later. So you know the downside of that surgery is a two-stage procedure. However, it can, it can be very effective, and you're using your own cells to regrow that cartilage. Um, additionally, another pre-joint replacement uh, procedure is there can be something called an osteotomy, which means where we actually break your bone and realign the joint so that we can open up that closed down space. Like I said, arthritis, you start to lose your joint space. These osteotomies act to try to crank it back open. Um, this is ideal for younger patients uh, under the age of 50 that want to save their knee. And uh, it's for one compartment of arthritis too. It's only on the inside or the outside. Um, it's really the goal is to prolong the lifespan of the joint prior to having to get a knee replacement. Um, it's a big surgery. So like, you know, we actually have to break the bone and it's a long recovery. So this needs to be indicated on the right person. And then finally, the tip top of the ladder, if all else, else fails, um, you, there's arthroplasty or joint replacement. Um, so there's a full total knee, which is, is what this is shown here, or a partial knee replacement, where you, if you only have one compartment of arthritis that can be replaced. Uh, so indications for this is you've got increasing pain, increasing deformity, you're unable to do the things you want to do. And, you know, I always tell patients, you shouldn't live your life in pain. Um, you know, don't wait till it's, so, yeah, you're so um, dysfunctional and in so much pain that you really um, haven't been living your life. So this is something that does a procedure that does last for a long period of time. And um, it's a very successful procedure. Um, so, you know, summary recommendations. Um, staying active is important for your long-term health. So, um, you know, even with knowing that you have a little bit of arthritis or some pain in your knee, uh, long-term you want to keep active. Um, know your diagnosis. There's a number of causes of knee pain, and we covered a few of them today. Um, however, you know, there's some more um, 
other causes that we didn't cover. You know, if you have an acute injury, like an ACL tear, obviously, or something that you're really concerned about, you definitely should get checked out uh, prior to continuing with exercise. However, a lot of these, you know, um, you can kind of go based on uh, symptoms and uh, um, just uh, know your own body. Um, the next is follow the golden rule. So again, if it really hurts, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Uh, so if, if any questions, check with a physician before. Um, watch for signs um, uh, for worsening symptoms, meaning increasing pain, increasing swelling. Those are signs that you're probably overdoing it and you might wanna seek medical treatment or at least uh, an opinion of a doctor to make sure it's okay to keep working out. Um, know your options, know both surgical and non-surgical options for everything. And again, like I said, know yourself, you know your body the best um, and it, make sure you uh, listen to your knees. Uh, so with that, um, thank you very much uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. You, there are there is one question that I'm seeing right now, um, and it is I had my right knee drained twice. The pain started after I started running on the elliptical, and I was diagnosed with arthritis. How much exercise is too much exercise for the knee? I know you just touched base on that a little bit, but if you could elaborate a little more. Yeah, like I said, um, you know, if you already know you have arthritis in your knees. You know, it's probably smart to at least try to incorporate strengthening uh, um, of the lower extremities, um, potentially some cross training rather than just pure running, um, to be able to keep yourself active and you know doing the things that you want to do. Um, I don't think there's an answer to that. How much is too much? I think you have to listen. Like I said, listen to your knee. Um, if you keep having to get it drained, or if it keeps you know causing pain and getting worse, then you probably are doing too much. I think you need to find like a happy medium. Um, whereas if you know you notice that like if I only run two days a week and I bike five days a week, that my knee really doesn't really seem to get too aggravated. So you know that is kind of what I would search for if I were you. Um, but you know too much is generally if you're starting to get increasing pain, clicking symptoms, swelling, uh, frequent needs to have the knee drained, more frequent need for cortisone injections. That's generally when it's going to be knowing that you're probably doing a little too much. And we have another one. What is quad saving surgery? So quad saving surgery has to do, I'm assuming you're talking about with knee replacement. So there's different types of exposures that you can do for a knee replacement where sometimes you could actually cut through the quad uh, to expose to be able to do the re knee replacement. And other times you don't cut through the quad. Um, so that's kind of just the difference just with the exposure. There's really no studies that show that saving the quad is any better than, you know, cutting through the quad. You know, the recovery is the same. Um, so that's really all that has to do with is just the exposure, the way the surgeon accesses the knee joint to do the knee replacement. And we have another one. Uh, with respect to the golden rule, how much pain should, call, should cause someone to stop that particular exercise? to the point of cannot continue or uncomfortable, but doable? So I would say obviously cannot continue, you should not continue, but um, it shouldn't be so that you're changing your stride. So like if you're running or exercising and it's kind of affecting how you're walking, affecting how your mechanics are, then that's too much, that's too much pain because you could potentially injure something else that way. So if it's just a very like low pain and it's not getting any worse, you're doing your PT exercises, you're doing um, all the treatments to make it better, then you know you can continue. But I would say if you get to the point where it's starting to affect your gait um, and changing the way you stride or changing the way you work out, then that's definitely too much uh, because you don't want to injure something else. And I, well, let's see. And we have one more. Um, at what age is too old for a knee replacement? Hmm. Well, it, d it totally depends. I would tell you there's no age that's really too old for a knee replacement. I know that some of my partners would do a knee replacement in a patient that's 90 years old if they're still you know, very active and healthy. Uh, so it, it just it really depends on the, the person and depends on their activity level and what, what their goals are. So, uh, you know, if you have any questions about that, I, tell, I would encourage you to kind of um, 
you know, ha happy to answer anything um, about knee replacements, but um, I would say there's really no age that's too old. You know, if, you, if you're a functionally active person, um, then it's definitely something you can consider. Well, I think you covered all of the questions um, right now. And if anyone has any additional questions after tonight, feel free. We're going to send this recording out to everyone and you can reply to that email directly with any questions or comments um, for Dr. Bishop to answer in the future. Um, we can get back to you on those answers to those questions. And just want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And thank you, Dr. Bishop, for tonight's lecture. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for um, coming. And yeah, like um, Jen said, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, this is my, you know, our, our number to our office. Um, and feel free, you know, I'm doing televisits as well for like people that don't want to come in so because of COVID or that are far away. Um, so, you know, happy to answer any type of questions that you guys have. Good luck, stay active, and uh, let me know if you need anything. Thank you.